Ai jidoch lodoch lodoch eh gebe Gleva Eh okay hi grand gwelshin live Margaridich. Agis. Hi. Hi, Egrain. Ashinil. Veli Gebrechu. Yeah, okay. I made the other Jeravik. Veli Gebrechu. Hi. Gleva. Ja, ja, ich habe schon Bio, Hamid. Gleva, weil ich bin in der Tasche gekommen. Ab, mit jedoch Postglück, Gleva. All right, mit der. Falsch um, Welcome to anybody watching this uh, video, be it live or um, in uh, later on when it's live on when it's on Facebook. We will be talking tonight about the Gaeltacht in Ireland and the possibility of a Gaeltacht in Scotland uh, with our guest speaker, Dr. Christopher Lewin, currently at the University of Galway. Um, this year's pretty big year for Gaelic in Scotland with um well the census we're still waiting for the results but hopefully they will give us a clear picture of the situation of gallic but it's also a big year because of the consultations that the government is putting together about um but scottish languages both scots and gallic and um exploring the possibility of creating a gale talk status for some places in scotland and so dr christopher lewin will explain to us tonight a bit more about what that means, what is a Gaeltacht, and how it works in Ireland, so that we can understand better uh, the possibilities that are ahead of us in Scotland. Christor, um, Yeah, come on. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. So I hope you can all um, see my slides clearly now. Um, so as as Fonch said, um, this is a, a topical issue at the moment. Um, one of the four um, main headings in the current consultation about language policy in Scotland is um, uh, discussing this concept of uh, designated um, geographically um, designated Gaelic speaking areas and what that might, uh, what that could mean. Uh, obviously this is an established concept in, in Ireland. And so I'll be looking a little bit about um, how the system works here. So just um, before I launch into that, a little bit about my background. Um, I am a postdoc researcher um, at the University of Galway, formerly until a couple of months ago, uh, the National University of Ireland Galway, funded by the Irish Research Council. Um, as, so the topic I'm going to talk about today of um, uh, territoriality in language policy and um, community language development is not my primary specialism, but it is a topic I've taken uh, interest in, both from a personal and practical perspective, having been involved in um, several minority language uh, movement situations um, uh, and and uh, from an academic perspective as well. Um, so my my experience of, of uh, the Gaelic situation is mainly from having um, lived and studied in, in Edinburgh. So I also have, uh, have visited uh, the Western Isles and Sky, um, the other parts of the Highlands and Islands um, uh, quite regularly. Um, but I, I don't claim to speak uh, for any particular community in any way, uh, and I acknowledge um, 
my lack of of personal ex experience of of uh, of living in such such communities. Um, on the other hand, I am from a small Gaelic island. Um, I, I, I grew up in the Isle of Man, um, uh, and I, I think I have some experience, therefore, of some of the challenges, logistic, political, and so on, of small communities and small island communities in particular. Um, I've also lived in Wales and um, a Swedish speaking area of Finland as well. Uh, again, different situations. And I'm currently based in the County Galway, uh, Connemara Gaeltacht in Unspidiel, um, a few miles west of, of Galway City, uh, one of the strongest Irish speaking areas, um, where the framework that I'm going to talk about um, is, is currently being implemented. So um, the last few months, I've got some experience on the ground of how things are working here in Ireland. Um, and as I say, um, my own experience of some aspects of this, this topic is, is naturally limited. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful to everyone um, from Scotland and Ireland in particular um, that, that I've talked to over the last couple of years about this topic. Um, okay, that's just a picture of, of where I'm currently um based in the in the Connemara Gweltacht so geographically and and the way of life and so on is is fairly similar um in many ways to the Gaelic speaking parts of Scotland um albeit it's on the mainland and much much closer to um a large city um so first of all oh, I should have translated that slide it says context and history um uh, is some background about the situation in Scotland. Um, so just the overall uh, context of this is, is the consultation, uh, which is currently open, deadline 17th of November, um, which has uh, four areas um, or key commitments, one of which is about Scots, the other about the others about Gaelic, um, education, a new strategic approach um, is is one of them. That's a very important topic, of course, as well, which which is interlinked with other aspects of Gaelic uh, development. Um, but um, it's it's a topic I'm not going to be specifically talking about uh, uh, today. Uh, the other two, on the other hand, um, uh, relate to perhaps new um, new directions in Gaelic policy and um, perhaps changes to the overall framework of, of Gaelic development. So the creation of a Gaeltoch and um, a review of the structure and functions of Borsna Gaelic. Uh, and also uh, there is a Scottish languages bill promised during the current um, parliament. Although we have at this stage, little detail as to what might, uh, what might go into it. Um, so the historical context, um, the 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 Gaeltacht was a concept that sort of crystallised in the early 20th century, um, as it was realised that Irish, which had formerly been spoken widely, at least in the south and west of the country, uh, was increasingly restricted to to um, uh, smaller uh, areas, uh, and official Gaeltacht uh, regions were designated in the 1920s, and then the current borders. Uh, were more or less fixed in uh, 1956, which was also when the when a specific Gaeltacht um, uh, government department was founded. And the Gaeltacht policy covers a, a wide range of different things, uh, specific education policies, um, housing, economic development, broadcasting, um, family supports, um, uh, signage policy and so on. And there are various institutions, uh, state institutions uh, and civil uh, civil society and, uh, organizations specifically uh, based in and supporting the Gaeltacht. As you can see, the Gaeltacht is not one region. It consists of uh, many patches, especially in the west of the country, the strongest of which are Donegal in the north, Galway in in the middle, in the west, and uh, Kerry in in the in the south. Um, in Scotland, in contrast, there isn't a sort of institutionalized concept of a Gaeltacht, although the word 
Gaeltoch exists um, tends to mean the Highlands or the historically Irish speak, uh, Gaelic speaking area, um, uh, much of which, of course, is, is no longer uh, Gaelic speaking today. Um, there's also been a fairly widespread view in Scotland that a Gaeltacht style approach um, might be unnecessary or not a priority or, or even detrimental to speakers outside um, the so-called heartlands. So that's been a sort of orthodoxy for quite a while now is that um, uh, this is this is something maybe not a priority. Um, and uh, uh, Wilson MacLeod in his history of, of Gallic development uh, calls it a, a rather circular debate. Um, however, it's a debate that's um, been uh, reopened recently because of uh, the developments we're talking about. Um, but it is a, a debate that goes back several decades, so perhaps one of the, the last major um, uh, interventions in this debate before the current system of um, Gaelic uh, language planning was established in 2005, was a report, um, uh, Johnny, uh, Johnny Alec Macafersing, um, uh, which talked about heartlands and energy centers. So the, 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 the Western Isles especially, and then, um, uh, the, the so-called energy centres of places like Glasgow and Edinburgh, presumably. Uh, it also recommended the Borden Gaelic be located in the, the islands rather than in uh, in Inverness, as it, as it ended up being. Um, this was critiqued for potentially marginalising the role of lowland and urban Scotland in language policy. Um, I'm not so sure that um, that, that was... Uh, that we can really read um, read that critique into it. Although overall, that report was was somewhat um, uh, somewhat uh, brief and and vague, and overall it was perhaps a, a lost opportunity to look more closely at this issue. Um, so when we got the Gaelic Language Act in two thousand and five, it has a predominantly national focus, focusing on the status of, of um, Gaelic as a, as a national official language, at least to some extent, um, uh, nominally equal to English in, in some, some, some extent. Um, however, there is a, a territorial considerations baked into the system to some extent. Um, so the system of Gaelic plans for public bodies and especially for um, uh, uh, local councils, um, uh, Borden Gaelic has discretion as to which bodies it um, it asks to prepare a plan when, and um, these uh, um, uh, these requests are to um, prepare a plan were sent out to uh, the Western Isles Highland, Western Isles Health Board, and so on um, at, a, at an earlier stage. Uh, there is a, a many questions over how effective this uh, language planning system is on actual language use. Um, it has some some uh, it has some usefulness in um, encouraging bodies to provide more existing services through Gaelic. Say, have more Gaelic speaking nurses, for example. Um, but it's probably less good for establishing Gaelic specific services so services specifically to support Gaelic that wouldn't otherwise exist um, that needs a specific framework specific funding and so on um, another problem is that there's no unit of language planning more localized than that of the council so there's for example um, the Western Isles has a the Western Isles council has a language plan but it's a um, mainly about what the council does rather than um, uh, how what's needed to strengthen Gaelic in the Western Isles, although obviously the two overlap. And secondly, um, it's not a specific strategic plan for how to strengthen Gaelic in Harris or in Barra or in Stornoway. Um, so uh, as we'll see, there have been um, sort of unofficial community plans um, uh, proposed in various locations, um, but there's no dedicated funding or framework or guidance um, for, for these things. So they vary from, from place to place and there's relatively little support uh, for them. Um, 
having uh, maybe been on a bit of a downer about uh, uh, the existing language planning uh, system, um, I should say, however, they are important. They are a chance to uh, to strengthen existing provision. Uh, they're renewed every few years, and the Western Isles um, Gaelic plan is open for consultation. The uh, the new draft one uh, until the 11th of November this year. Um, okay. Uh, so other writers um, have suggested that there should be some kind of Keltach policy. So Rob Dunbar in 2010 has a paper on this, um, uh, this subject. Um, pointing out some of the weaknesses of the, the current system, uh, especially in terms of um, uh, the breakdown in intergenerational transmission and use of Gaelic in, as a community language and more support needed for, to, uh, um, for in that area, which has been re reiterated, of course, many times since. Um, so he mentions uh, the um, family support um, uh, schemes such as TOOV in Wales, um however the somewhat less clarity on structures um though he does suggest more coordination of existing institutional plans um apparently to be overseen by Borsna Gaelic um an important uh, an important moment was the uh, Shawbost report so this is um a very detailed report on a particular um, district on the west side of Lewis, which was uh, released in 2011, which had um, very stark news about the state of Gaelic in, in, in one of its heartlands. Uh, and, but one of the conclusions was language development workers and community volunteers are needed to work directly with individuals and families in the community. Um, and there's a quote there from a local resident um, commenting on just the the impact that the uh, research team themselves had that were just there for a few weeks, um, and the the need to have have something like that on a on a longer term basis. Um, following on from that, a community plan was launched in in uh, in in Shawbost, but to the best of my knowledge, it was only a a, a short term um, a pilot, and I'm I'm not sure that it had. Uh, too much impact long long term, either in that location um, or in terms of replication elsewhere. Um, though, uh, if if anyone knows more about uh, how it how it worked out, um, uh, please correct me or get in touch with me. Um, it's probably not an an accident. The Board of Galax budget was cut around the same time, so perhaps um, there wasn't uh, much of an appetite to be funding new things in. Uh, in addition to their um, existing statutory uh, responsibilities. So again, an illustration of the kind of um, gaps and, and, and weakness that, that there is in current provision. Another problem with, with the current system is that um, what support there is for uh, community development um, is, is mainly in the form of short-term projects. Um, uh, funding is very centralized, so there's a kind of vertical relationship between a particular particular organization organizing a particular project, um, going up to Botna Gaelic, um, getting money coming down if you're lucky. Um, uh, so uh, participants in the um, uh, community consultations that Alistair Allen did uh, a couple of years ago commented on this, that there's a perception, there's a trend of centralization. Uh, there's a lot of pilot schemes that may or may not be effective, but there's rarely enough uh, resources to um, monitor or assess if they were effective, and then um, they just disappear after a year or two. Um, and this, as I said, there's this vertical relationship rather than a budget and uh, a strategic plan um, at a local level, which would encourage a horizontal relationship between local bodies working together to identify uh, what are the the needs and priorities of of a particular um, local area? Um, this this kind of um, system is arguably baked into the the uh, the current system um, in the the Quango model, which was all the rage um, uh, at the time and the the early years of sort of the new Labour period. 
Um, it was claimed at the time that this would, um, there should be a, well, it was presented as a good thing that the should, funding should be based on projects, not on organizations. But arguably, that means that you get this short termist tendency um, and uh, existing organizations that build up experience um, and best practice over time um, are, are liable to have their funding cut. Or in, in some cases, you could mention CLE or Project Nanyalan. Um, uh, end up closing down altogether. Um, so I think with hindsight, we can we can uh, uh, question a lot of the assumptions that were made in in setting up this um, uh, this framework. Um, one of the the relative success stories, though, um, um, who who do their best to um, to uh, have a kind of network of um, community development ventures or, or enterprises projects uh, are called immersion is common the Gaelic common the Gaelic was the, the main Gaelic body before Borsna Gaelic and it's since been kind of rebranded as a uh, community development uh, charity um, uh, focusing especially on, on youth work um, so again with uh, uh, as all Gallic bodies, resources are limited. Uh, so there was a strategic prioritization on, on youth work, where previously these um, structures had a more um, general focus on community development. So obviously there are pros and cons with that. Um, each Imusht has a, a, an officer uh, and a £2,000 uh, development budget, uh, which really is... is, is is very much on a shoestring compared with um, similar geographical units in Ireland, which have um, a full-time officer or more than one officer um, uh, uh, doing uh, more general community language uh, community work um, and a much larger budget of 60,000. So that's in 60,000 euros or more, um, which is excluding the, uh, the salary. Um, Okay, so another development uh, uh, recently was the the Gallic Crisis Report, which again reiterated the alarm bells about the situation of Gallic as a community language and proposed this um, uh, local Gallic Community Trust model, um, which um, has been some commentary on so, uh, a level of con controversy. So, according to uh, one group of of, um, of scholars, uh, this proposal fails to address fundamental issues concerning membership, governance, operation, and interactions with existing um, bodies. Uh, be that as it may, um, I I would be tend to be of the view that the basic principle that uh, Gaelic development needs to be closer. To the communities and with more input and control from uh, communities and at a more local level that that overall principle is is perhaps more important than uh, than the details at this stage bearing in mind that uh, anything that's in implemented would go through uh, numerous stages of refinement and consultation and so on um, and more than anything else this uh, publication definitely has put Gallic community development higher on the political agenda. Uh, I don't think we'd be having this this uh, conversation about the consultation and the uh, languages bill uh, without the influence of of um, of this publication. Uh, funding at the end of the day is a huge uh, huge issue, and in my view, is not talked about enough. Um, so. Uh, the Scottish government often comes out defending its its provision on Gaelic, saying that the Gaelic budget has gone up. That's true for the overall Gaelic budget in nominal terms, um, but if you take inflation into account over the last 10 years or so, um, in reality, it's a real terms cut of around 15%. Um, and then if you look at the... So total Gaelic funding includes things like education, um, and broadcasting and the capital fund which funds um, school buildings mainly. 
Um, if you look at Bordner Gaelic, which is basically responsible for all the sort of Gaelic specific um, uh, development, and Gaelic specific schemes and, and, and funding streams and so on uh, outside those other areas, um, they, their budget has been frozen at around 5 million uh, for most of its existence, and it was actually cut in in 2011. Um, so about two and a half million per year uh, goes to Gaelic development funds. Um, I think about a quarter of that goes on this network of Gaelic officers. Um, uh, the, the funding situation gets even worse, though, uh, if we consider that the two reports which led to the uh, which uh, led to the founding of Bordner Gaelic and the Gaelic Act, um, both recommended a minimum budget of 10 million per year. And that was, um, as Macpherson put it, uh, to create the minimum conditions that will stabilise and develop the language. Now, taking into account of inflation again, that would be more than 15 million in today's money. So basically... Bordner Gaelic and everything it funds, including Common the Gaelic uh, and many other um, uh, organizations and, and local projects, um, are underfunded. Uh, so they only have a third of the funding that they should have as a bare minimum. Um, okay. So to move on to the situation in Ireland, I'll try and go through this quite quickly. Um, so uh, Although there have been a lot of policies, uh, specific Gaeltacht policies in, in force for uh, for a long time, for 100 years, um, actual specific language um, planning or, or, or policies specifically designed to address uh, the, the language situation um, is, is a relatively new development. And the, um, the centerpiece of this is the Gaeltacht Act 2012, which established 26 Gaeltacht language planning areas. Uh, also, Gaeltacht's uh, service towns, which means towns in and around the Gaeltacht, uh, which are considered uh, hubs for um, offering services, uh, both in the private and public sector to, to Gaeltacht residents, um, and Irish language networks, which would be recognised networks of, of, um, of significance in other parts of the country. Um, and all of these uh, designated areas have um, a community organization is identified, is, is appointed uh, by the government, uh, and they have two years to prepare a language plan, uh, usually with the help of a, a, um, a language planning consultant, and there's funding to, to, to pay for them. Um, and then once the plan is approved, they will have seven years to implement that with uh, with assistance from Uther Osno Gweltacht, the, the main sort of the Gweltacht, Quango Gweltacht development body. Um, they also have, each area has 100, 250,000 euros per year, uh, including the salary of one or two um, officers. Now, one of the features of the Gweltacht is, um, as, you, as you can see, well, I look at the, this is County Galway specifically, so you can see where I am right now, the, the red dot there. Um, so this is the um, the largest Gweltacht area in, uh, in the country and the one with the, the biggest population. Uh, and you can see that it's been split into uh, about eight or so, eight or nine um, uh, language planning areas. And they vary hugely in terms of uh, the strength of the language. So there's areas where um, over 60% of the population are daily Irish speakers. So not just that they can speak Irish, but they claim they do speak Irish um, outside the education system um, on a regular basis. And then there's other areas where it's less than 5%. And this reflects the the, the fact that the Gweltacht boundaries were set in the 1950s um, and, and haven't really changed since. That's an entire other controversy in, in the Irish situation, and I don't expect that it will be replicated in Scotland. So I don't expect, you know, Easter Ross or, um, to be to be designated a, a, a Gaeltacht. 
however much we might um uh we might bemoan the the loss of uh of garlic in those areas um and the the actual populations of the areas um uh, vary uh, significantly as as well so this is donegal in the north um and you can see i've highlighted two language planning areas with very very different populations so uh, both areas um with where the language is is quite strong so we've got torrey island with a, a population of 114 and daily speak only 85 daily speakers but that's 75 percent of that that small population and then a much larger area on the mainland uh with a population of almost 6,000 and almost 3,000 daily irish speakers and of course um if you do some crude calculations that works out at um over a thousand euros per person per year in Torrey, there's coming from this budget. Um, uh, whereas in Guidoward, it's only 52 euros per, per person. Um, so, you know, obviously there's not a direct correlation necessarily between um uh how much is spent and what the what the outcomes are, but um we can nevertheless expect that um this budget will go a lot further um and and uh produce uh have a lot more um outcomes and effects in Tory than it would than it does in Guidor potentially uh again this is an issue that I don't suspect would be so much of a problem in in Scotland because we don't really have uh very small isolated islands um uh, in Scotland uh that are Gaelic speaking so if if St Kilda was still populated this this might be an issue um but uh most of the small Gaelic speaking islands have bridges or causeways and are closely integrated to their their neighboring uh, neighboring districts um anyway so um essentially uh Mishnach, um the the Gaelic uh Gaelic campaign group which is hosting this this talk um last year published a proposal essentially to replicate um this system in Scotland uh with uh, um, suitable uh, adaptations and and improvements um I was one of the authors of of that policy um but I would I would um emphasize that I'm at the moment talking uh giving my own opinions on on, on all this um uh the paper also uh supports the Gaelic network uh concept so um recognizing uh probably especially Glasgow Inverness Edinburgh and Aberdeen I think are the most obvious obvious candidates for this where there's substantial networks of speakers and um and substantial numbers of Gaelic institutions uh Gaelic education and so on um also a proposal for a coordinating mechanism um we were uh, less prescriptive on this because it sort of it, it depends on a lot of moving parts like what else changes in the overall Gaelic um Gaelic policy framework um, so you could talk about a new department within a restructured board na Gaelic, um, so long as it has some autonomy uh, and is is based in in the islands. Um, potentially a new role for common the Gaelic, or potentially a, a, a new a new body such as the Oras na Gaelic concept, um, uh, which the the Gaelic crisis research uh, raised. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much in detail about um, exactly how how the system might work, but just um, in in broad in broad terms, um, some of the pros and potential cons of such a system. Um, so we have to weigh up all, all sides of this. I think uh, one of the biggest um, advantages of, of this kind of system uh, is simply that it establishes the principle that Gaelic community development should be. A proper policy area in its own right um with you know attention being given to it uh, um budgets that are relatively stable uh clear uh, frameworks and guidance and uh, institutions uh delivering it um 
on a par with the more established areas of Gaelic medium education, Gaelic broadcasting, and uh, Gaelic uh, language planning for institutions, all of which, of course, have a statutory um, basis or a, or a long-standing policy framework and significant um, stakeholders uh, involved in them. Um, it would uh, have budgets and decisions at a more local level. Um, I think it's important to, to say that um, I, I think it should be on a statutory basis, similar to that in, in Ireland. Um, uh, there are opinions floating around that you could do a lot of this under the existing legislation, just by executive fiat. Um, and that's true in, in theory. Um, but I think you'd have a much uh, much clearer and more solid basis for this uh, in in new legislation, which would be harder harder to roll back, harder to defund uh, in the future. Um, though I do think um, interim measures are appropriate, and uh, we don't want this to be kicked into the long long grass and not implemented for another ten years. We need. Uh, parts of this this system to be implemented as soon as possible. Um, talking to people involved in the system here, one thing that struck me, um, talking to a couple of language planning officers uh, uh, in this this area, um, is they said that it just even though the system doesn't give them too many direct powers, like the some of the proposals for this system that. Um, uh, wanted the, the system to have more power over things like housing. Um, uh, uh, so, and, and there were criticisms that it that it doesn't, and that should be, of course, looked at in adapting the system. However, the very fact that it has a law behind it, it's not just some voluntary scheme, it's something with um, legislative backing, it's official, um, gives it more legitimacy if you're going if you're a language planning officer and you're going to um talk to a local business for example you're not just some random voluntary group or something um while at the same time these people these these workers are embedded in local communities they're not just like and, and they're employed by um by a local organization um so it's not just someone sort of foisted on the community from from outside um as i said several times uh providing a holistic approach to local needs so the strategic plan would look at what does what does harris need or what does glasgow need probably very different needs some similar uh some different but at the moment that there is no mechanism for identifying what the needs of uh, of of Gaelic communities or networks uh, are um and while you still have this very local level of course there's also um sharing of knowledge resources best practice between areas if something's working well in one area the um uh, the other areas can learn from them of course um, and the fact that this system has already been implemented in Ireland means that, uh, and, and there are reviews of, of all the language plans coming up, means that there will be, um, in the in the uh, near future, there will be quite a lot of um, experience and best practice and analysis of what's gone right, what's gone wrong, uh, to draw on from Ireland as well. Um, and uh, the structures won't... Uh, um, of course, some some communities might be more proactive in engaging, or some community organisations might be more proactive than others in engaging with this this system. Um, uh, but nevertheless, you it will be better than the current situation where the existence of anything like this depends on someone in a particular in a particular area having having initiative and drive and vision um, to try and 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 um, and uh, produce some kind of, of uh, local strategy, um, which has has happened in some places, uh, but but uh, but uh, but not in others. So this system would create a common baseline uh, between uh, between communities within the recognised Gaeltacht and 
and Gallic um, networks. And this isn't um, a cure-all, this isn't a magic bullet. This, I, I hope, wouldn't be the end of the road in, in Gallic community development, but rather a foundation which could be built on. So it hopefully creates a structure uh, for vo voicing local um, local needs, local concerns, and identifying where there still are weaknesses and further uh, and and um, uh, potential for uh, further further development, or further activism to 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 ask for more um, risks or uh, disadvantages. Um, well, with any anything like this, um, uh, no matter what level of resources are put into it. Um, there will always be an argument that more resources are, are um, would be desirable. Uh, uh, does it put an extra burden on on local communities that are facing um, all manner of other challenges and um, duties and red tape and so on? Um, is there a danger that there was still a lack of resources and power, but with new responsibilities? Uh, there would still be a tension between uh, local demands and and national requirements or, or, or responsibilities. Um, there would be difficulty finding people for local committees. Um, if the, the, the Irish system was just replicated, um, it still has um, a lot of gaps in terms of uh, power or influence over housing, education, uh, local democracy. Um, but I think... Uh, there's limits to what you can do with uh, a language specific uh, piece of legislation. I think there needs to be a wider conversation about reforming local governance in Scotland as a whole. And there is an ongoing process looking at that, which seems to be um, seems to be going very slowly. Um, but uh, theoretically, that is on the on the Scottish government's agenda as well. Um, specific weaknesses in the Irish system, I've, I've talked about a couple of these, um, that there are sim the same or similar budgets for an area with less than 200 people um, and with over 5,000 people, no clarity about funding at the start of the process. Um, so a lot of these plans in Ireland were written at a point when the communities involved had no idea what, what funding, if any, they would receive to actually implement them. Uh, so obviously there should be clarity about funding from the start. Uh, the funding they did get, uh, so this is Udros Nagelthacht, the Gweltacht Development Body, as well as language policy. It, it does economic development. It supports infrastructure development. So apparently uh, the funding uh, for this system was actually taken from the budget for repairing roads in the Gweltacht. So obviously that kind of um, that kind of uh, choice um is is um is not ideal between um essential inf infrastructure and and uh, and language development then there are questions about the working conditions of language planning officers and consultants uh, on things like short term contracts um levels of pay the whether there's um, opportunities for career development and so on uh, the risk of burnout, bearing in mind the um, the wide range of of um, responsibilities and issues they have to deal with, um, and uh, while this system was brought in, a lot of other schemes uh, had their funding cut or were discontinued entirely um, around the same time in the wake of the two thousand and eight crash. And looking at the current economic outlook um, in the UK, um, there are obviously big questions about what the what the, the fiscal situation will be going forward and how that will impact things. Um, so just to give a, a quick analysis of the uh, the consultation paper, so I recommend everyone reads this and and responds to it um, by the middle of November. Um, so there's again the four key commitments and the the, the ones we're particularly talking about, the Gaeltach, and potentially reviewing Borsh and Um, So the first thing to say is they're saying the right things and uh, they're talking about uh, they have an aim to increase 
Gaelic language use in the vital areas of both home and community, and to have a focus on arresting language shift in areas with significant speaker numbers. Now, I think it's a significant victory for the Gaelic community and the Gaelic movement as a whole to have this explicit focus in black and white on communities, home use, and language shift, and to be actually be using um, precise terminology because for a very long time, um, you might get politicians saying a couple of words about, about Gaelic medium education, maybe about broadcasting, um, but very little about the specific challenges of uh, the weakening of the language uh, in the community. Um, so that in itself is a step forward, um, and I think uh, the opportunity should be taken to seize that and hold them to this, hold their feet to the fire, as the phrase was a few years ago. Um, uh, they also mention the Gaeltacht Act, well, more than mention, they uh, describe how it works in, in some detail. So this is the Irish system, there's about three paragraphs of factual fairly accurate uh, presentation of how it works. Uh, so the, the people that wrote this uh, consultation paper are aware of the of this system, but it's presented in a very neutral and factual way with, and they're careful not to endorse it. Um, so I think there's probably a recognition that this would be a significant investment if they did something like this. And at this stage, they don't want to make any commitments. Um, so I think, to get something like this set up will require very clear and precise responses to this consultation um, asking for specifically for for this. Um, the issue of divisiveness is raised um, and the potential conflict between um, designating specific areas as being of specific uh, of being specific Gallic character in comparison to uh, the concept that Gaelic should be for all of Scotland, it should be a national language. So this goes back to the, the sort of in, the wariness of the Gaeltach concept that has been uh, visible uh, for a long time in Gaelic policy making circles. Um, but I think the kind of proposal that I've outlined in this talk and that's in the mission paper uh, and in the Irish Irish model, um, I think it addresses addresses this effectively. Uh, we're not necessarily saying that one type of community is more important than the other, but that they have different needs um, and uh, that, that for Gaelic to be promoted as a national language, it needs to be supported at a local level and it needs to be supported, especially in those areas where there are sufficient densities of Gaelic speakers, either as a large as a significant proportion of the overall population, or in terms of absolute numbers in places like Glasgow, uh, because those are the areas where you can do this, where you can implement this kind of, of model. It's not a model that will, would work um, everywhere in Scotland. Um, there's uh, this this thing about uh, lines being drawn on maps and that would be divisive and difficult to reach agreement. Well, I mean, yes, to some extent there will be um, there will be disagreements potentially on where lines should be drawn. I think some of the areas are fairly obvious. Barra is a is an obvious unit, whereas um, the internal divisions of where you draw lines in Lewis, for example, might be less obvious. Um, and that would mean, need to, to take place in consultation with, uh, with the communities concerned. However, having said that, um, we have to recognize that local, local policy means borders. You have your uh, uh, parliamentary constituencies, council wards, catch, school catchment areas, um, uh, the councils themselves and so on and so forth um you know any kind of localized policy means borders you have to draw a line where the jurisdiction of one entity ends and where the next begins and uh, these may sometimes be arbitrary to some extent 
but you know you just have to handle that sensitively and thoughtfully um uh, and and uh, and try to uh, try to resolve any 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 issues that arise um there was a slogan going around um a few months ago uh, after one uh, one uh, seminar event looking at gallic policy um gallic gallic gunchrichen gallic without borders which um i think is a very uh, sounds good it sounds inclusive uh, but as I say, when you actually think about it, uh, you know, you have to define local units if you want to do anything uh, locally, at least for, for some purposes. Um, and there at the bottom of the slide, I think this, this is quite a good, uh, good quote um, from the Dunbar paper um, talking about the uh, possibility of a, of a Gaeltach con concept where he says the sensitivities that the Geltach concept engage cannot be allowed to impair both debate and serious locally focused policy and planning uh, initiatives. I think that encapsulates the, the point here. Um, oops, I've gone out of this for some reason. Or am I still sharing? Uh, okay. Okay, right. Um, so still just talking about the uh, the consultation. Um, there are some alarm bells in it. Um, one was, uh, well, I think this is the first thing looking at what the Geltach concept could actually mean in practice. Um, and it talks about uh, questions about what Gallic measures could should be secured in this area. So this is in the Geltach area, however it's defined. Uh, should GME be available in all schools? Should bodies adopt a bilingual approach? Uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but the, the thing is that all of these are things that are already in place, at least to some extent, um, in the Western Isles at least. Um, so I think the question would then be, so what difference would this policy actually make? Um, so this is maybe beyond the type of framework that I've been talking about um uh, so if they're going to uh, make changes in or, or make improvements in these areas i think we need more detail on on exactly um what strategy could be in place uh to make progress in these areas because if it's just um essentially rebranding what already exists um that wouldn't really be um much of a step forward uh, there's also um, question marks over how willing they are to consider additional funding. So there will also be questions of whether any additional resources could be allocated to this area and how this could be monitored or regulated. So, of course, as we saw earlier in the presentation, an awful lot of additional resources are needed. And I think it's very important that people um, in the Gallic world um, uh, really read up on this topic and 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 have the have the figures and so on on the tip of their tongue because it's very easy to sort of think this is complicated and dry and and um and not be entirely sure how things are divvied up um and and what the changes have been and what the comparator the comparators are with with other policy areas within Gaelic other policy areas within Scotland um and language policies in other countries but when you actually look at any of those from any of those angles the the situation is 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 very very um very very weak uh, there's a huge funding funding gap from by any by any measure and that needs to be at the heart of any kind of, of campaigning on on this issue um because otherwise they will get away with putting an additional quarter of a million into this um and and calling that a grand new departure um then they talk about making progress with this commitment by a review of the guidance on gallic language plans produced by Bosnia the gallic and then they talk about these powers under the 2005 act um and as i said you could do more with the existing powers 
but I'd be very wary of relying on that um, because that gives a lot of, of uh, leeway and, and wiggle room to actually end up not doing not doing very much. And I think from a, a strategic point of view, on, from an activist point of view for campaigning on this stuff, you want to ask for the strongest and clearest and most robust mechanism in the in the first place uh, when you're arguing uh, for for these things. Um, then there's mention of uh, island communities impact assessments. Now this is an, an interesting and innovative policy instrument, which means every new policy that um, or every new you know uh, uh, initiative that public bodies in the islands um, or affecting the islands uh, implement, they have to do an assessment on how it will impact various aspects of of island life and uh, one of which is is gallic there's now an explicit uh, mention of gallic in that process uh, and this kind of model could be extended and ha has already been been implemented in in wales in terms of language impact assessments and and that has the potential to embed um greater consideration consideration of language issues on a much wider range of of um of areas and the very last thing in that paragraph is the potential to create local community plans. So I think from this we can we can glean that um, they would prefer tweaks to existing frameworks, which is not surprising. Politicians and civil servants would rather get away with um, doing small things or rebranding things rather than doing the hard work of um, of actually and the politically brave work. Of actually implementing something substantial, um, but the mention of local community plans—you can just about see the outline of the of the Irish model, or the model that we've been talking about in this presentation. So, you know, the door's still open. If 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 people push for this, if people push for a substantial step forward, the door is half open on this stuff. And I think it's essential that people do push for this. Um, there's also a mention of of um, networks and and something that that looks a bit like the the Gaelic language networks that um, that the Mishnah proposal uh, uh, includes and and that are in the the Irish model as well. So you can just about, as I say, you can just about see where um, the sort of framework that I am talking about could come out of this with sufficient. Um, with sufficient lobbying and uh, responses and campaigning. Uh, so what will come out of it? Well, as I say, they'll do as little as they can get away with. There's many other things weighing weighing on them. Uh, the, the people that are actually doing this, the, the Scottish government isn't a monolithic organisation. This is actually a small number of people in a small sub-department within one department has many other responsibilities. Um, and they are probably facing similar challenges in pushing for these things from the inside as um, uh, activists and campaigners face from, from the outside. So there's no point being moralistic about this. Uh, they will do as little as they can get away with, probably. But we have to be prepared for them doing as little as they can get away with. However, um, the, there's everything to play for uh, if people are willing to... Um, to uh, demand it, basically. Uh, more will be gained with a clear united position, commanding as broad support as possible. And I've been quite concerned about some of the um, uh, some of the debates in, in Gallic circles in the last couple of years, uh, which have not really uh, have produced more heat than light, one could say. Uh, and, and really, we need to move on from that. Uh, we also need to build on existing campaigns for local local language plans and other local initiatives, such as uh, campaigns for Gallic centres in, in various places. There's very strategic questions. Um, how much uh, should Gallic um, activists or Gallic organisations focus specifically on language policy or wider issues, of course, of housing and jobs and infrastructure and so on, which are arguably, uh, well, well, are a lot bigger and more important issues. And they are uh, 
also uh, closely linked in with uh, the, 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 the fate of the, the language. Um, having said that, language policy is important, and there are relatively small number of people and, and organizations that can uh, weigh in on it, that have the knowledge and, and, and experience to, to um, make proposals and to push for things. So I think those who can um, do have a responsibility to focus uh, on uh, making progress with, with specific language policy when the opportunity um, arises. Um, should we promote existing models or tweaked versions of existing models or something entirely new? I mean, the the strategic basis of the kind of proposal um, that I, I've been talking about here is essentially adopting a model that already exists in, in Ireland, not saying it's perfect, not saying it's the end of the road, not saying it solves everything. But um, I think there's probably a better chance of convincing um, a rather cautious centrist government to adopt um, a, an existing model than than something uh, entirely new, even if the entirely new thing would be more radical or more effective in, in theory. Then should there be an exclusively local focus or a national focus or both? And in particular, um, should Gaelic activists be pushing for a model specifically just for the islands? Now, there is a argument for that. There is a sort of moral and strategic arguments of various kinds for that. Um, however, I think it's clear as things stand that if there's going to be progress in one context, it will have to be uh, in in both contexts, in the, the mainland or urban context as, as well. That's just a matter of political realism, um, uh, apart from anything else. Activism at, at this stage, I think there's a lot of room for um, for lobbying, for um, res responding to this consultation, and so on. At a later stage, if if things are not um, satisfactory, uh, there might be an argument for a more confrontational um, campaigning uh, approach. But that's a, a question for further down the down the line. I think um, should Gaelic organisations. Um, be looking at this on their own, or should they? Should there be some kind of united front? And I think the second would be would be more desirable, perhaps, in view of the the history of 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 when progress has happened. It has tended to happen when there's a broad consensus that certain things, such as a Gallic Act, uh, were needed. And again, I think the sort of disunity on some of these issues is is potentially. Um, potentially a problem. Um, okay, actually, I think that yes, that brings us to to the end of the presentation. So I don't know if any of the people uh, watching live want to put questions um, in the in the Facebook comments or or uh, Fonch, perhaps you have your own questions. I'd be happy to answer anything. Grow, grow more on that at the function bar. That only inch of us. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Uh, we do not yet have questions. We had a, a few watchers. Uh, we have a comment um, from uh, Fionne MacLeod. Uh, it has been very good listening to you, but so far, sadly, I do not see how you can either grow or create a Gallic community anywhere in Scotland. There are ma major areas of natural development that are simply missing. Uh, I can grow. I congratulate you on what you put together. So it's more of a comment. I don't know if you want to to respond to it or if you have anything that brings to mind. Well, I mean, all I'd say is that this what I've been talking about this evening is covering a few aspects of this topic and a particular strategic mechanism for making some progress. Um, it doesn't claim to solve every problem. It's not about and it's not about establishing new communities or new uh, networks. Uh, I know Finlay is involved in in um, in uh, encouraging the the formation of new networks of Gaelic speakers in in various locations. Um, so this is more about providing um, additional support and coordination um, and, uh, uh, and and strategy 
for um, the existing major networks of speakers, both in the islands and um, in the, the major urban centers primarily. But definitely there's room for a lot more in various areas. Mm -hmm, indeed. Uh, another comment, just uh, thanking you for an interesting presentation. Um, just well, following what you just said, um, and you, you mentioned it actually a few times, how uh, you talked about activism, you closed on activism, and in many ways, having an official status, having something that has a structure that is managed at a high level with, with budget and so on, um, would be in a way fair, because you, you mentioned how currently it does rely a lot on volunteers, on people locally doing what they, they feel is right, which especially in the Western Isles, uh, you're expecting people to have to deal with fuel poverty and lack of housing and starvation in some situation. You're asking them to, to take their volunteering time to work on something that is very difficult. So having some form of status, some form of official recognition might help having people dedicated to that rather than expecting quite unfairly from disadvantaged citizens to actually take into their own hands. Um, at this stage, with the consultation going, what do you think activists in Scotland, be it, obviously we're talking here, uh, Mishnach is hosting, but many people are activists without being in Mishnach. What, what could activists do at their own level to support uh, maybe a, a step in the right direction? Well, I think in the context of the, um, the consultation, the most obvious thing to do is to re respond to the consultation. Um, you know, there's often cynicism about, you know, these kind of, uh, uh, it's not a particularly radical thing to do to just be writing letters or or replying to consultations. But I think especially in small policy areas, um, this kind of thing can make a significant difference. Because at the end of the day, whether the, uh, an additional half a million pounds is dedicated to Gaelic or 10 million pounds or or whatever. It's all pocket money from the point of view of, of a government with, that's that's dealing with billions of pounds. Um, you know, the, the huge differences in funding, huge differences in, in policy from the point of view of Gaelic speakers or or small Gaelic organizations can come about as the as the from the, you know from the stroke of a pen of a relatively junior civil servant, you know. Um, so trying to influence these people as much as possible, you know, is is worth it, I would say. Um, obviously, if we were trying to um, uh, change a much higher level area of policy with much bigger budgets affecting the whole country uh, and the government, and it was something an issue where the government really didn't want to budge on, uh, you know, then, you know, a much bigger, much, uh, uh, much more direct campaign might be called for. And, you know, maybe uh, Gaelic activism will reach, will reach more that stage at some point. But I think at, at, at the moment, um, the capacity of, of, of the Gaelic community as a whole and of the existing Gaelic bodies um would suggest that um, you know trying to change the uh, change things, or tweak things by conventional means um, certainly should be attempted. Um, so I think writing into the consultation and trying to, I mean, people can make their own judgments about whether the type of framework uh, that I've set out here and that Mishnok is proposing is one they want to support maybe people have other ideas but if you whatever it is you do want to see out of this make sure you're specific about it make sure you uh, underline the funding situation uh, in as much detail as possible because i think a lot of the debate or discussion on all this stuff um, tends to be quite anecdotal or tends to avoid engaging with the actual issues of what okay what exactly are we going to change or what exactly are we how exactly we're we going to engage with the actual processes um policy making processes that are actually happening you know a lot of people will talk it around this issue around you know their experience of of, of you know working for community organizations and wherever 
uh, and they'll probably identify a lot of the problems and in general a lot of the challenges and the kinds of things that need to be changed but and that's fine but you need to actually engage directly with where are the opportunities to change things where are the levers where is the leverage um and stay state clearly exactly what you want um i mean if people are persuaded that this kind of gail talk um local community plan model is at least part of the answer then please say that in your responses um uh, you know say explicitly that that we need something like this um otherwise as i say they'll they'll just use the vague responses they get to justify you know a few tweaks to the status quo um also uh if there are opportunities to engage directly with with the policy makers um face to face or or online at consultation events i saw um uh, just today i saw an advert for one they're doing at the university of aberdeen i think uh, right at the beginning when this opened in august there were meetings in uist and uh lewis one i went to myself in lewis um so i'm not entirely sure if there have been more meetings but if there are any meetings face to face go to them try to put the case as clearly as possible and try to persuade people also uh, other community members to put forward as strong a case as possible um uh, try to uh, we need to try and diffuse this divisiveness charge because i think um and this charge that it's not inclusive to have specific policies for specific types of communities because that that will only end up with no communities or no you know gallic contexts getting extra support you know we need to diffuse that argument and and move away from that and be emphasizing you know we can have a model which has more support for the islands and also more support for Gaelic speakers in Glasgow, most of whom, of course, are islanders or children of islanders or people have some connection uh, 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 to the islands. It's not this kind of, uh, you know, Hebridean native speakers versus learners that have no Gaelic heritage. There's not these two monolithic demographics that have nothing in common or don't overlap. Um, and the, the challenges of trying to raise family through the media to speak Gaelic in Glasgow um, are in some ways the same as the challenges in 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 Harris, especially nowadays where Gaelic is a more of a network language everywhere. There is truth in that, um, for better or worse. Um, so you know we need these if to produce the um, maximum number of Gaelic speakers in in the next generation or the generation after that. We do need these supports as much as possible in all the locations where they could be uh, could be effective. Oh, that that makes sense. So take part in the consultation. Surely sending to us. Um, uh, an interesting comment that comes up from a Canadian. Apparently, uh, it is so important to develop and strengthen living communities. I live in Canada, and the last census was disappointing in 2016. Uh, 3,980 people said they have a knowledge of Gaelic while in 2021 the number had dropped to 2170 and this with an increased interest and availability I, I think the the last bit is is quite the interesting part i suppose here that we have seen a big increase in interest in gallic in the past year obviously duolingo has been kind of a uh, symbol of that with half a million learners or, or how many um obviously it's very symbolic but it's, there seems to be loads of interest. People want to know about Gaelic, learn about Gaelic, and yet um, numbers are dwindling, and and we're not expecting very high figures from from the coming census. So, uh, despite the fact that there is public interest and and there is loads of emphasis, not only in Scotland but in many places, on developing public interest in the language, as if that would give us magically thousands and thousands of new speakers, um, but that's mm. that's not the case. Um, so I suppose, I don't know if you, you have a, anything to, to add to that comment and to that idea or once again, it's not really a question, but. Well, I mean, I think all these things are, are positive and, and obviously can, um, will have some positive effect. So there are people now, there are people now who have learned Gaelic because they started with Duolingo, for example, and every single individual that learns Gaelic, that becomes fluent in Gaelic 
is an addition to the community, the overall community, especially if they're located in the certain locations where that where that makes a specific difference. Um, but again, there are dangers. And I think the danger I see with things like Duolingo is the use that's made of them rhetorically. So um, in sort of official Gallic promotion contexts, I, I think I, I, I too often see things like Duolingo being touted as you know solutions or or good news to sort of drown out bad news so um i mean i think borna gallic's got a bit better at this recently but a few years ago at least that there was this very much this perception that they were almost mandating that bad news be covered up at all costs and they didn't want to engage with the challenges and the the um uh, negative headlines and they would just drown them out with oh well there's you know half a million people learning Gaelic on Duolingo well uh, okay but you know the thing is that Gaelic is not a, a unified entity Gaelic doesn't really exist only Gaelic speakers in specific places or specific contexts exist so just because a certain number of people learn uh, have some, learned f- at least a few phrases of Gaelic on Duolingo doesn't necessarily have any impact on you know, the strength of Gaelic in Harris, where where you are. Um, you know, uh, how many people in Harris are learning Gaelic on Duolingo? You know, if you're lucky, maybe, or or maybe one person, you know, and out of the people who are learning Gaelic on Duolingo, how many of them actually become fluent and active users of Gaelic? A, a fairly small percentage, I, I, I guess. Um, so the question shouldn't be, you know, is is Duolingo good or bad, or is you know how important is Duolingo? It's okay. What is the strategy for promoting Gaelic in Harris? And if part of the strategy is get a certain number of people to uh, uh, say incomers to learn Gaelic, uh, okay. What are what are some of the tools that could be used to set them off on that journey? And then maybe Duolingo is part of that strategy. But it's the strategy for for strengthening Gaelic in Harris that's important, not, you know, the good headline about Duolingo. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, I, I totally agree. And I, I guess it's, I mean, um, many of these of these discourses seem to span a bit from, you know, follow up uh, Thatcher and her. There is no such thing as society. It's individual. If people are interested, they'll do the job. And this idea that you don't need to, if there is enough interest, is obviously we all know the failure of that uh, and the need mm. for strong, strong policies. Um, so it is, it is quite interesting to to also reflect on the fact that more positivity and more uh, motivation in people to learn about Gaelic doesn't actually mean that the language itself will, in any way, be healthier. Um, I. Somebody was asking whether they could ask a question, but no question has come forth in the in the chat so far. So just in case it comes in a in a minute, I have uh, another thing. Just going back on the Irish model, uh, you mentioned in your talk something that that is very true in many aspects of policies, which is a lack of continuity. The fact that you will have a project or a pilot, and even if it is very successful, funding is dropped. And mm. so there is no way to build on things. People will have one year contract and, and have to leave their job, even though they might actually make more of it if they stay longer and so on. Do they address this continuity issue in Ireland in any way in the Gaeltag model? Well, if we're talking about this, this specific uh, uh, model, uh, I mean, obviously, I'm sure there are projects that are short term, like other projects or projects that this this system uh, supports. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about the the system, the, the the language planning area model as a sort of foundation or bedrock. Obviously, there are lots of other things alongside it or that it might interact with. But in terms of that system itself, um, I mean, I don't know exactly what contracts language officers are employed on, but in principle, the plans uh, last for seven years and well they've only just been introduced in the last few years so some of them are have been in place maybe three or four years now um uh, so it's not 100 percent clear uh what will happen next 
Um, I mean, the assumption is, I think, that it will be a rolling process, that there'll be a renewal of plans and, and, and you know, a review of progress and a new plan every seven years. Um, so potentially these off the, the, the language planning officers, um, I think, are, are employed on a, on a longer term basis. And I think that's that's healthy. And I think seven years is a good. Is, is a fairly um, it's a fairly decent uh, time span to to make some progress as opposed to sort of the two or three years or even less that that often seems to be the case with with Gallic um, Gallic schemes and projects. Um, so I think I think on a more short term thing is the language planning consultants. So this is the stage before the plan before the plan is implemented when it's the people that are are subcontracted to actually write to the plans. That can be a sort of six month, you know, or year uh, part time contract of you know a graduate level job. Um, difficult. I mean, it's a it's a job that requires a lot of knowledge and and expertise so there's a conflict between getting people that are experienced enough to do that job and this sort of kind of junior level of precarious um precariat style um employment that it that it uh, that it encourages so there are these structural weaknesses um and i think there's a lot of things that need, would need to other things that would need to be done to address that kind of thing so um, I would say that there needs to be a lot more training. There needs to be things like degrees in language planning in Scotland. Something doesn't exist in Scotland. Um, there needs to be um, so at the level of not um, maybe at the national level, but certainly at the um, islands wide level or at the level of of overseeing the process as a whole. There needs to be some kind of body which can provide support and maybe help uh, help communities to write these plans um, on a less precarious model than just random people being uh, being uh, employed on short contact contracts to write them. Maybe there should be a team of um, community language development uh, specialists that help help the communities to 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 uh, develop strategies. Uh, that that makes sense. Uh, thank you. I don't see any further question in chat. However, uh, for those listening or those watching that later, uh, the video is available on on Facebook. Uh, in so you can leave a comment if you think of a question later on, and we'll make sure to check it out and and maybe provide you with with an answer if, if possible. And we should be on YouTube as well. And hopefully, yeah, we'll be able to put the, the video there as well, so you'll have ways to to rewatch it and uh, and comment on it, and maybe ask your question then if you think of anything. Uh, yeah, for, meantime, for anyone that, uh, well, for anyone that's uh, going to come along and criticize us for speaking in English uh, this evening, we did do a Gaelic version of this presentation last week, and that is already on Facebook and YouTube mm -hmm. um, uh, as well. But we thought it was important given the the relatively small size of the gallic speaking demographic we do need to reach out to um those interested who who may not be fluent in gallic so uh, that was the reason that we we did this in english uh, this evening uh, and it is it is a national consultation and and as you were saying many people will be touched by that may not feel confident in in listening to gallic so both both languages are relevant here uh, thank you very much for your time tonight and for the presentation. It was quite clear and hopefully uh, will be of interest. It was of interest to people following us tonight and will be of, of interest to others that will watch it later. Um, if you have any closing remarks, know it's a time. Otherwise, I will stop the uh, live. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.